model. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Susan Jones and welcome back to my Sunday Spotlight. Today I have a few tips for you for teaching informative writing. And specifically I'm going to talk about doing a, an all about research based project, which was one of my favorite writing projects to do in the winter with my first grade students. Now this writing unit is absolutely one of my favorites. I do have a unit for it over on TPT, it looks like this. And in that unit I go ahead and share all the different writing paper templates that I use and the main lessons for teaching your students how to go through this process and create their own book. But in this video, I wanted to share just some top tips for getting your students to be able to write these books effectively and also to make them as interesting and as fun as they can be while teaching best writing practices in your K through two classroom. And don't worry, I also have plenty of tips for you if you are teaching virtually so you can still continue to do this unit. So let me head over to my computer and while I do that, be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in a minute. Okay, tip number one to help make this an effective and fun writing unit for your kids is to involve a lot of student choice. Now, student choice is kind of at the center of writing workshop anyway, and I talk about this in my other writing workshop videos, but as often as you can, pretty much every unit, you should try to have students choose their writing topic and write about something that's meaningful to them. Now, in this case, since they are going to be researching and writing about an animal, you should let them choose which animal they want to research and write about. Think about it, if your students are having to write about a pigeon when they don't really care at all about a pigeon, maybe they've never seen a pigeon, maybe whatever. I'm also choosing pigeon because pigeon has to go to school is right there. But if you let them choose an animal that they find interesting, they are going to enjoy this a lot more. Now there's a couple different ways you can do this. And when I was teaching in person, and I'll go ahead and share some pictures, but what I would do is before we started the unit, I would head to my local library and get a ton of books and I would pick between eight and ten animals that I could find many different uh, range ranges of books so I would look for you know some of those National Geographic books they're like pre-reader it says at the top so I would look for some easier to read books that students could decode themselves let's say about Jaguars and then I would look for plenty of other books about Jaguars remember even if your students can't read all of the books, they will be able to gather tons of information from some of the captions that they might be able to read, the diagrams, the photographs, and you can always help them read it or they're working in groups where they can also learn from their partners. So you don't need to only get books that are at a just right reading level for them. In fact, you shouldn't. So I really would look at my library and see what books they had and I would try to pick between eight and 10 animals and get about five to 10 books per each animal. So it was a lot of books I was gathering, but again, I really wanted my students to have this hands-on uh, experience where they are getting to flip through and read those books and gather as much information they can about animals that interest them. Now, once you've gathered all those books, what are you gonna do? You're gonna take them in your classroom, and what I would let students do is right after I told them we were going to be researching and writing our own all about book, this is where I would let them explore. I would explain that we're going to be fact finders and we're actually going to be researchers, and we're going to get to choose one of these animals to write an entire research book about. So I would spread out my books around the room in groups of the animals. So I'd have all my bear books here, all my shark books here, etc. And I would have them all around the room and I would put students in uh, heterogeneous groups. That way they weren't all at the same reading level. So if students did need help uh, reading a word or figuring out what something was or just talking to their group about what they've learned, that way they could all have access to these texts. And I would set the timer for maybe five minutes per group. And I would just have students walk around with a little fact finding sheet like this one. And they would go ahead and at each group, they would just flip through the books, look at the pictures, read what they can. And they would write down any cool facts they learned from their little exploration. At the end of this research-based lesson, we would not only just share the facts that we learned, but I would also let students know that this is the time where they're going to get to choose which animal they want to research. And I would have them do that by picking their top three. Because what I would do is that night I would take home and students would rank their top three choices 
and which animal they wanted to learn about and I would go ahead and put them in groups. Because I only had a limited amount of books, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I didn't have seven kids all in the shark group and only one in the bear group. I, I wanted to have them work together, even though they're all creating their own books, but that research part, I really wanted to have them work together. So I had never had a problem with this where every student will always get something in their top three choices. So if there's, you know, 10 animals, they would always get whatever they put in their one, two, or three, and usually they can get in their first or second choice. And I would just go ahead and make those groups for students, and the next day they would find out which animal they will be researching. And I've never had any sore losers, I'll put it that way. I've never had anybody be upset about the animal that they've received. Now, you might be watching this video and you're saying, wait a second, I'm teaching virtually right now. I can't gather, you know, 40 different books and send them off to my students to kind of look through. But in my SJT writing club, I actually just made my all about book unit. I made it uh, digital for students in Seesaw and in Google Classroom. This is something I'm doing with a lot of my units in the writing club. And one of the things I did for this section is I made a little virtual learning sheet like this one that I'm actually gonna offer you guys free today. So I will link this down in the description. But what I did is I found eight different animals and I found little National Geographic for Kids videos about each animal and students can basically click on it and they will listen to the two minute long video and then they will write down a fact that they learned from that animal. After they finish filling out the fact sheet, then they can go ahead and choose one of those animals to research. Or of course, since they are at home, if they do have the help of a parent or an adult to gather books from a library or maybe you could share books with them, I'm not exactly sure how your class is doing this right now, but I also have plenty of kid-friendly websites where they can go ahead and research some of these animals, which I will share in the next tip. Tip number two is to make sure you have your students have enough time to actually research their animal. There's no way they're going to be able to write an entire all about book about an animal if they haven't had time to learn about the animal of their choice. So you can do this a couple different ways. If you're in the classroom, you may want to load up their book bins with kid appropriate books about their animal. Some of my favorites are these National Geographic for Kids. Um, they're the skinny little ones that look like this and they have some, they're usually leveled. They sometimes they say pre-reader level one. This is a level two, here's a level one, but they are great for the K through two range. And even if students, like I said, even if they can't read the text, they have tons of nonfiction text features. Like this one here has a diagram with labels, which is something we actually do in our book. There are captions. There's just a lot of great information that students can learn, even if they can't fully decode every word on the page. So you can load up their book bins. You can also go ahead and schedule some time throughout this three to four week period where it's just like a research group time. So maybe once or twice a week, students are meeting with their group. So all the kids that are learning about bears and they can just pass their books around. They can go ahead and share some information that they learned just so they are getting to know a lot about their animal first. That way during the writing workshop portion of the day, if students are writing about where bears live, they won't have to spend as much time researching it if they already know that answer. Now they still may need to grab their books and research a little first, which I highly encourage during that writing time, but like I said, just make sure you have some time for students to go ahead and learn about these animals that they're excited about in the first place. Now, virtually there are a lot of great resources as well. And actually last year I shared a video with five of my favorite websites for kids to research about animals. So I'm not gonna go into that right now. I'll put a little picture of it right here. And this is actually all five of them if you wanna pause this and take a little picture, or I will actually go ahead and link in the description the video that I made last year where I explain a little bit about each of those websites for your kids. Okay, tip number three for doing your informative writing project is to make sure you schedule in catch-up days is what we call them. Now, I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the video, but this unit that I do is usually about three to four weeks. So it's a long in-depth unit where we go over a ton and students write so many different pages after they've researched about their animal. So let me just quickly run through what pages I usually add in our All About book. So by the end of the unit, students have usually made a cover page for the beginning, a table of contents, 
They usually do a diagram of their animal with labels. They do a different types page, which is like if they're learning about bears, they might say different types of bears. If they're learning about frogs, they might say different types of amphibians. And they just share four of these different types. Then we have some content pages where students are sharing where the animal lives, what their animal eats. They will often do a how-to page so we can also integrate some other types of informative writing. So we do a how-to page where it might be how to take care of a dog or how to find an owl in the wild. They go ahead and add a glossary where they can share some of the important words they learned throughout this project. And then we usually do a couple fun pages like a dedication page where we dedicate this book to someone and an about the author page where we can go ahead and share a little bit about ourselves. Now, as you can imagine, that is a lot of pages and that is a lot of work. And as you know, your students work at vastly different speeds and paces. So what I would usually do in my writing workshop classroom is I would have my students if it was a simple page, like a diagram, let's say, basically the mini lesson that day would be, what is a diagram? Here are some examples of a diagram. This is what it looks like. And then students would go ahead and do a diagram themselves. So they would go ahead and make their animal nice and big and take up the whole box and add labels of the different parts of their bodies. And some students may finish it that day. Other students maybe ha only have, you know, an outline of it. They don't really have it colored in yet. Maybe they didn't add labels, so on and so forth. And that is pretty much the case for every single one of those pages that I mentioned we include in the book. So throughout my three to four weeks, I would make sure that I would add in catch up days where students that, you know, maybe were behind a little bit on finishing up those other pieces could just sit and work on those pages. Now, if you have students on catch up days who have already finished their work and they have nothing to catch up on, I would always encourage them to either go back and add a lot more to their illustrations and add more details. They could also add more to their words or they could go ahead and add another content page. And when I say content page, those are the pages where students are actually writing some nonfiction paragraphs. So we would do one, you know, what a shark eats or what my animal eats. And I would teach them on those days and this would usually be a two day lesson. Not every page is just one day and then they complete it that day. Some would take two days that I planned in that way. Because on those nonfiction writing days, students would want to learn they might have to first research what their animal actually eats. And then we would talk about writing a topic sentence. So a shark eats fish in the cold waters. Not a great example, but off the top of my head. And they would have to write that topic sentence with some supporting details and a closing sentence. So I would of course have to teach them how to do that. So if your students all caught up, they can go ahead and add a brand new content page. So if they already wrote about where their animal lives and what their animal eats, maybe they want to write a new fact that they learned. Maybe if they're doing tigers, why tigers are endangered and they can write their own little paragraph. And you can kind of help them with that, especially on these catch up days because many of your students will be uh, working independently on something they already know how to do. So you could definitely walk around and help out those students that maybe wanna add a little bit more. All right, tip number four, my last tip for informative writing is to add a little fun into your unit. Now, naturally, I think this unit is a ton of fun and it's pretty appealing to your students anyway because of the reasons I already mentioned. They get to pick their animal, they get to write and publish a long, fun book, but as your students get going through the process, you might see from them and they might start to realize that this unit takes a lot of writing perseverance. And we talk about that a lot within the unit. If I start to see students, and I might not do this whole group, but in small groups, if I see them you know, starting to get bogged down by the amount of work that this project takes, then we talk about perseverance, we talk about ways that they can help themselves in the process. Some of your students might just have the you know, perfectionist syndrome where they want to make sure everything is perfect and they take a really, really long time. And while there are so many great things about that, we might talk about you know, where to kind of let that go a little bit so we can move along with our books. Now, two fun things I like to do to add to the fun factor are to add caption action bubbles into our stories and also to have a publishing party. Now, two very different things. The caption action looks like this, and you can do this with your early finishers, those students that maybe don't need those catch-up days, 
or you can choose to do it with everybody that wants to, totally up to you, but I would often talk about what a caption is, and naturally you've come across quite a few if you've been doing this research project with your students, and students can go ahead and add these little caption bubbles, and I usually have them cut them out on some construction paper, and they get to glue it into their stories to add just a little bit more detail to the readers. I always find that students love getting to actually cut and paste and add it right into their book, and it adds a whole nother level of fun into their informative writing. And lastly, of course, after all of this hard work, you should definitely have students have a little publishing party in the classroom. There are many different ways you can do this. You know, pre-COVID, I would invite my parents into the class if they wanted to come. I usually would do it about 15 minutes before school ended. So we would have a little publishing party where we would bring apple juice, we would toast to each other. And I would often have students get in groups where they could share, usually one kid from each each animal so it could be different and they could read their books to their small group or their parents whoever was there if you don't have much parental involvement you could do this with another buddy from a different grade level and of course if you are doing this virtually you can have students if you're on seesaw they can read their book and actually record a little video to share with you all maybe you want to have them pick just one page that they want to share but definitely celebrate all the hard work they've done and these are honestly some of my favorite books to send home. They are such great keepsakes and they're just so much fun to do with your kids. So there are some of my top tips for teaching informative writing in a K through two classroom. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you haven't already done an informative writing unit with your students, I hope this inspires you to do one. And if you have done one in the past, I hope some of these tips can kind of help you navigate that journey a little bit better. I have that digital freebie for you down in the description and also if you want to check out my uh, all about unit that I have on TPT, I'll also link that down there. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and give me a thumbs up so I know. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. Also, if you have any of your own tips for teaching informative writing, please drop them down in the comments so we can read them. See you guys next week. Bye.